First off, before we begin, I want to give a big thank you to anybody who has checked out anything on this channel. Whether that's this video, the streams we have done, any of the panoply of videos we made during the draft's first round and the second round, or if you have been here before, that I want to thank you because we just reached 20,000 subscribers on this YouTube channel. I mentioned this on Twitter, but it's actually kind of crazy because it took us almost eight years from February 2012 to October 5th, 2019 to get to 10,000 subscribers, but from October 5th, 2019 to October 6th, 2020, we gained another 10,000 more. So this channel has been around for a very long time, but what we did in the past calendar year was we essentially doubled the YouTube channel's total sub count and view count which is the entire span of eight years condensed into an extra year added on top, which is absolutely astounding to see. I'm so happy with all the growth. Thank you so much for being here. But we have ourselves some RFAs, no longer RFAs, potential UFAs to be, to talk about here in this video. And my, oh my, do I have some opinions to give out about these ones here today. So let's start about with the very first and probably the most important one that the majority of you are probably clamoring at your screen to talk about. Let's talk about Troy Stetcher of the Vancouver Canucks, because Troy Stetcher was not qualified by the Canucks yesterday, and as a result, will be on pace to becoming a UFA by the time the free agency window opens at 9 a.m. PST on October 9th. And Troy Stetcher is a guy whom, if you ask probably the majority of Canucks fans out there, they would probably say the same thing in that they wanted to keep this guy. Troy Stetcher is a guy who has played with the Vancouver Canucks for three years now. He signed as a free agent back in 2017 after wrapping up a really good season with the North Dakota Fighting Sioux alongside Canucks prospect Brock Besser. And as a guy who is from Richmond, a guy who was a hometown grown talent who has been a Canucks fan his entire life, he is one of the more underdog hometown hero stories on this hockey team. As a guy who was able to get 17 points in 69 games this past season, Troy Stetcher is legitimately defined by many as a very capable bottom-pairing, middle-pairing defenseman who was able to do some damage on the right side. However, because he is a guy who would be eligible for an arbitration that would be at some number, the Canucks just weren't able to qualify him. And this comes because of the same reasons the Canucks are projecting to not be able to re-sign Tyler Toffoli. And it's why Jacob Markstrom's name is in the realm of possibility for entering free agency too. Because this team just has not managed its cap. So now, when it comes to the important times, to sign guys like Toffoli, to sign guys like Stetcher to contracts that they actually kind of deserve, they're not able to do it. Take a look at some of the tweets over here. This is what Sportsnet Murph, this is Dan Murphy. He spoke on Sportsnet 650. Likely, the Canucks' plan is to circle back and offer Stetcher a contract around what he is making right now. Stetcher will have to decide if that's something that works out for him. The philosophy behind this idea is that, okay, if you're a defenseman, you're an RFA, and you are eligible for arbitration, Arbitration automatically means that you're probably going to be in the realm of making more than what you were making beforehand. That's kind of what the whole deal is about. But because of the flat cap, this isn't something that the Vancouver Canucks can afford to do as easily as they would want to, especially because Troy Stetcher is not really one of the top dogs on this team. He's quite literally just a middle six, bottom six defender. So even though there was no plan to actually qualify or extend an offer over him, this is what Rick Dollywall said, they just straight up cut ties with Stetcher. He's going to the UFA market. Let's take a look at what Benning said about this here. I talked to Troy this afternoon. This is from yesterday. I explained that this is a business decision. He's been a warrior for us ever since we signed him. If he went to arbitration, we probably could have gotten an award that we weren't comfortable with. So because of Stetcher's already established loyalty to the Vancouver Canucks and him stating several times that he wants to continue playing here, the Canucks are kind of betting on him to have him not actually sign anywhere else if he goes to free agency because, hey, okay, now that you're a free agent, we can sign you to a contract that was similar to what you had before. Who cares if you have other teams knocking on your door asking for a more expensive deal for you to sign? Come back to Vancouver because we're your hometown team. I don't like the 
overall planning behind that because obviously there's no guarantees. I get that a player can definitely say, yes, I want to stay a Vancouver Canuck. I want to play here next year. I don't want to sign anywhere else. But all of a sudden, if a bottom feeder team with a ton of cap space is knocking on your door and they're saying, hey, man, you want to play for us? We'll give you $3.5 million a year. That's difficult to say no to. And obviously, you know, it's up to Stetcher. We'll see what happens. But the asset management point of view with Beagle, Sutter, Roussel, yeah, it's all kind of whack. And we all know that here as Vancouver Canucks fans. But I did want to talk about a few other RFAs turned UFAs who were not extended qualifying offers by their hockey teams. Let's take a look at these guys over here. First off, Andreas Athanasiu. Oh my goodness. We spoke a few days ago, or was it a few weeks ago? Again, time. It's flowing very weirdly in my mind. That the Andreas Athanasiu trade for the Detroit Red Wings was an absolute win for them and an absolute pitiful, pathetic loss for the Edmonton Oilers. Because the Red Wings essentially gained themselves what was Theodore Niederbach and Sam Stang, two guys we talked about on the channel, in that trade. They used one of the seconds they got in the Athanasiu trade to trade down with the Kings, and they got a few extra picks there. And they still have another second round pick next year from Edmonton from that Athanasiu trade. And all the Oilers get from this is what was not a good amount of games out of the former Detroit Red Wings 30 goal scorer. Andreas Athanasiu. CU 26 years old, 6 foot 2, one of the faster players in the league. He got 9 games played with the Oilers and only 2 points. And then in the playoffs he had 4 games played, 0 points, boo hoo. The Oilers essentially got a very 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 small return here for what was two draft picks. You could say Gagne, Kuffner also included in the deal too, but come on. We all know what the bread and butter is with this trade. However, next up on our list to talk about for RFAs turning UFAs, it is Anthony Duclair. A very interesting story over here out of the Ottawa Senators, because Duclair was one of the guys that I think a lot of people were mostly surprised to see hitting that UFA market. Because he was a guy whom it was actually revealed earlier in the media that he wanted to represent himself in contract negotiations with the Senators. He's a guy who scored 23 goals and 40 points in 66 games, the most previous season, but there was no agreement to be made. Take a look at this tweet over here from Brent Wallace, TSN Ottawa reporter. Dorian says they didn't qualify Duclair and that they offered Duclair a substantial raise, but that it wasn't able to work out, actually. They weren't able to agree, they didn't want to go to arbitration, and now Duclair is going to be an available guy on the market. He's a guy whom a lot of people were saying, okay, what, this is a very productive player. I mean, 40 points, 60 games on the Ottawa Senators, that's certainly not bad, right? And that's absolutely true, but the biggest problem with Duclair comes consistency, which is why a lot of people were somewhat understanding of the idea of not keeping him around in Ottawa, especially with the idea of Eugene Melnick and Dorian not wanting to shell out some big bucks for a guy that many people would say would not be one of the top guys on the Senators in a few years, because once Stutzla, Norris, Logan Brown, all these guys, and all the other established prospects they have in their system come up, it'll be a lot more difficult for a guy like Duclair to have the solidified role he had in Ottawa this most previous season. So, is this a guy who you expect to be a number one player on your team like Brady Kachuk, or does he become more of a depth piece once some of these other prospects come into the system? So, that certainly was a dilemma there, and from my perspective, it makes sense to say that the inconsistencies with this game put him in a spot where it wasn't foreseeable that he would become that top guy like a Stutzla, like a Kachuk, etc., which is why they were able to let him go to free agency. So, with that being said, I just wanted to go over one more guy here from the Red Wings. We have some Red Wings fans on the channel, and I say some in a very lightotic way because I know we have a huge portion of Red Wings fans on this channel. Brendan Pirlini, a guy who I honestly was sort of high on, eventually was not tendered a qualifying offer. He will be a UFA. This is one of the more unfortunate stories here in Red Wings Nation. 24 years old, 6'3", 212 pounds. He's a guy who was pretty good with the Coyotes a few years ago but got sent over to Chicago. He got some points with them, but then eventually was traded over to Detroit. He played 30 games with the Red Wings this past season, and he wasn't really all too great. Four points on the season. Perlini's a guy whom I honestly was really high on previously. He was a former top pick in the 2014 NHL Draft, 12th overall too, but now his career has gone down a difficult path. He hasn't really been able to produce to the way that people thought that he would be able to back when he was drafted in 2014, and now he is going to be a free agent. So, 
For the Red Wings, for Steve Eiserman, I saw a lot of people praising Stevie Y for actually pulling the plug here on Perlini because after one year that was this poor, it's obvious to see that you could either take this one direction and say, okay, we still think he's going to bounce back, he's only 24, or you could say, well, we'd rather use our cap space elsewhere. So that's kind of what the Red Wings did here. It's an unfortunate move because you want to see young guys succeed at the NHL level, but sometimes they just don't really do all too well, and they don't establish themselves in a realm that allows you to say, yeah, you know, we need to absolutely do this. We need to keep this guy. We need to sign him back because... For Brennan Perlini, that certainly wasn't the case. However, you could debate that was the case for some of the other guys here. Stetcher, Athanasiu, we could talk about Duclair as well. Talk to me in the comments what you think about all of these different RFAs turned UFAs. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for 20,000 subscribers. It means the world to me, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's Rolls 99. And bye. <laughs>